once a proud nation of hunters and warriors, but now the poorest of the Southwest Indians, the Navajo people live in a barren and rocky reservation of 25,000 square miles. Most of the land is in Arizona and New Mexico. They are still a nomadic people, frequently moving from place to place on the vast reservation, wherever their small herd of sheep and goats will find grazing land and be fairly near one of the scarce water holes or springs. Their herds are the Navajo's livelihood. They drink the goat milk, and sheep and goats provide all their meat. Their women make rugs and blankets from the wool. Wherever the Navajo decides to settle down for a period of time, he plants a little corn and builds a hogan of heavy pine logs with mud sealing the cracks. The women folk set up their looms near the hogan and work on their rugs and blankets between other chores. The trading post is the Navajo's only link with the outside world, the trader his best friend. Whether he wants to buy staple foods or sell his surplus sheep or get help for a sick member of his family, the trader will take care of his needs. The Navajos often use their silver belts and other jewelry instead of money if they run out of cash. This has been an accepted custom for many years. The trader simply writes out a ticket for the valuables received and he will, in turn, give the Indians groceries, clothing, or anything else they desire. He puts the silver into an old safe called the pawn. Every Navajo trader has one. No matter how long the Navajo's jewelry stays in the pawn, there will be no interest charged against him, and it will never be sold. Sam B. Gay, a fine silversmith whose father is a medicine man, comes to the trader to buy scrap silver, which he will cast into conchos and bracelets. Scrap silver is cheaper and just as good for his needs. He buys it by the ounce, and he will be paid the same way when he delivers the finished product. Sam knows of a place not far from his Hogan where there is some white sandstone, soft enough to be cut and used to make a mold. After he has found a stone about the right size, he looks it over for possible cracks. The stone is good, and he returns to his lonely Hogan six miles away from the trading post to start his work. With a saw, he first cuts one side of the stone down to a flat surface. The design is then drawn on the surface with a pencil, and it is hollowed out with a sharp knife. A slab is sawed off the stone and cut into a rectangle. The straight lines of the design are carefully drawn with a ruler on the mold. A layer of soot covering the design makes it easier to put on the finishing touches. Tallow is burned against the inside of the mold. This new layer of soot will prevent the silver from sticking to the stone. A second slab of sandstone wrapped together with the carved one completes the mold. The silver, which Sam has placed in a thin, hollowed-out stone, is melted over a fire, with a blowtorch adding heat from above. It is now ready for pouring. The melting pot is removed from the fire, but the blowtorch is held close to the molten silver to keep it liquid, as it is poured into the mold. The mold is unwrapped and opened. Sam lays aside the cast, which is still very hot. After it is cooled off, the neck of the cast, which is the part that filled the pouring hold, is cut with heavy tin snips. The mold marks are carefully filed off all the edges. The cast is sanded and polished, and another piece is ready for the trader. The Navajos, famed as makers of fine rugs, are still using the same kind of primitive vertical loom they used several hundred years ago. Because they move about so much, their looms are highly portable and can be set up in a few minutes anywhere. Luke Yazzie is helping his wife Irene fasten the yarn beam to the frame. After the loom is set up, Mrs. Yazzie goes out in the desert to look for plants which will supply her with dyes for her yarn. The Navajo women use certain plants, roots, and tree barks for their dyes. Mrs. Yazzie has dried the herbs in the summer hogan, where she lives with her husband during the warm months, and now she is about to make the dye. Some squaws powder their plants after drying, 
but Mrs. Yazzie prefers to boil them whole. She uses Navajo tea for yellow, juniper boughs for brown, and the roots of the juniper for red. Having placed the roots in the water, she adds a piece of lime as mordant. Its purpose is to make the dye permanent. The yarn is dipped into the solution, and when its color is deep enough, it is hung up to dry. Now that the loom has been set up, there are other chores to be done for Luke Yazi. The sheep in the pasture must be looked after, and their small plot of corn must be watered, while Mrs. Yazi works at the loom. After she has pulled the yarn through the shed, she pushes the batten up and twists it to open the shed, passes the yarn through, and then packs it down with a comb made from oak wood. The batten is taken out and the heddle pulled down. Though the fabric seems delicate with the sun shining through it, the finished rug is very sturdy. Where there are larger family groups living together, all the women take some part in the work of weaving. One woman is busy carding the wool, which has previously been washed and dried. This is done to straighten the tangled fibers. Using a couple of combing cards, she combs a handful of wool into a big fluffy roll ready for spinning. Another woman rolls and twists the wool until it is a heavy strand. She keeps twisting and pulling it as she winds it onto a spindle. The strands are re-spun until they are of the desired thickness. A third woman, with the help of her small daughter, is setting up a new warp by passing the yarn alternately over and under the thread beams so that the yarn makes a figure eight on each round. Grandmother is working on the loom, making a saddle blanket with a traditional diamond twill. It has taken Mrs. Yazi many days' work to finish her rug. Now it is ready to be sold at the trading post. The Yazis are leaving for Pine Springs early in the morning. The trip will take them two hours over rocky and dusty roads. They plan to spend the rest of the day at the trading post. Luke has heard that the white trader from Window Rock, which is the capital of the Navajos, is due in Pine Springs to pick up the rugs and silver jewelry that have been finished recently. Sam, the silversmith too, has heard of the white trader's impending arrival. He wants him to see a new pattern which he has cast in silver. If the trader likes it, he will make a sample belt connecting the single pieces, or conchos, with a strip of black leather. And if he thinks the customers will like it, he will place a large order with Sam. In his kerchief, Sam also carries bracelets which he has cast, bent, and mounted with a polished stone. The finished jewelry is piled on the silver scale again. The price for the scrap silver he bought on credit is deducted from the fixed price per ounce of the finished product. The difference is what Sam has earned. While Sam Begay's silver is being weighed, the Yazis have arrived at the store. Mrs. Yazi, who carried the rug, lays it on the counter, and Sammy Day, the local trader, looks it over carefully. Being half Navajo himself, he is an expert at judging Indian rugs and jewelry. Luke Yazi has his eyes on a pair of heavy shoes which might come in handy for the winter season. He examines them carefully as Sammy Day checks the rug and determines the purchase price. Mrs. Yazi has agreed on the price. Their pond silver belts are returned to them, and they get some cash in addition. With it, they'll buy staple foods at the store, and perhaps a piece of velvet for a squaw dress for their little daughter. Luke might even purchase the shoes he saw, but that will take more time. The Navajo likes to think it over carefully before he makes a purchase. In the meantime, it is nice to have the money. Carrying their purchases, the Yazes leave the trading post. Luke walks a few paces ahead of his wife, as is the custom among all Indians. 
A little later, on a piece of ground the medicine man donated for an airstrip, they all watched the arrival of the white trader from Window Rock, the capital. Mr. Sewell, the trader, was hired by the Navajo Tribal Council to be the manager of their Arts and Crafts Guild, which is one of their tribal enterprises. Because it is his job to find and expand markets where their products can be sold, he will closely check the quality of all work. New patterns of silver or on rugs are shown to him for approval. The work is good. Mr. Sewell knows there is a demand for well-made Indian rugs, and Navajo silver craft has become very popular, especially in the western states. He will fly to other trading posts in the reservation to pick up more finished goods. If things go well for the Navajo artisans, there will be fewer silver belts in the trader's pawn next winter. There will be a little more money and a little less hardship in the lonely Hogan's. So long, trader. This is the land of the Southwest Indians of the United States. Made up of a part of New Mexico, Arizona, and small areas of Colorado and Utah, it is an arid land of sandstone buttes and valleys covered with yellow rabbit bush and mesquite. Except for the Navajos, the Indians live in pueblos, or villages, making their living as farmers, planting mainly corn and raising small herds of sheep and cattle. For hundreds of years, the Pueblo women have made their own baskets and pottery. Some of the men excel in making silver jewelry. The Hopis built their pueblos up on high cliffs where they would be fairly safe from enemy raiders. In the village of Shungopovi, on the second mesa in Arizona, live some of the Hopi's best basket makers. For their raw materials, they pick the tender inner leaves of the yucca bush, which grows in the desert a few miles from the Pueblo. Mrs. Esther Honani has just returned from a trip to the desert. Slung over her back, she carries the load of yucca leaves, some of which she will bleach white in the sun, while others will be dyed brown or red. She already has a supply of yellow yucca leaves which she picked last winter when the yucca is a natural yellow. The dyed shoots must be soft to work with, and to prepare them for use, they are laid on moist sand, and another layer of sand is sprinkled on top of them. They are covered and left for several hours until they are flexible. Now the job of basket weaving really begins. Mrs. Honani and her married daughter Adeline are working together. They must make 45 baskets for the family of Adeline's husband in exchange for the wedding garments they gave her. This is the way a basket is started. A bunch of split yucca leaves is held in one hand and moistened straw is wound tightly around it and then bent and tied into the beginning of a coil. Adeline's mother is continuing work on a deep coil basket which she began several weeks ago. Adeline has now completed the center part of the coil. A steel awl is the only tool used. In earlier days, an awl made of bone was used. Mrs. Dungura, a neighbor, has dropped by for a chat and admires one of the finished baskets. Watch how Mrs. Honani splits the yucca leaves before she uses them. Her daughter fills her mouth with water and wets the coil to keep it pliable. Of course, basket weaving is a slow, tedious job. It takes several days to make one, not a few minutes, as shown on the screen. The basket is completed. Notice the white line that breaks the pattern from the center to the edge. This is the spirit line, which the Indians believe will allow the evil spirits at the center of the coil to escape. The spirit line is found on the oldest basket still in existence. Adeline is proud of a basket she modeled after a Kachina doll, which represents an Indian goddess of rain and fertility. The Pueblo of Zuni, 40 miles south of Gallup, New Mexico, was first seen by white men in 1537. This adobe church, in ruins now, was built by the Spaniards nearly 300 years ago. 
The stone house to the right of the church belongs to the present chief or governor. Next to it lives 90-year-old Isawasi Alapawa, who is the Zuni's oldest pottery maker. There is always a crowd of youngsters about when she works in her tiny yard. On top of a high butte southeast of Zuni, called the Corn or Ancient Mountain, the Zuni people hid their crops and took refuge when the Spaniards drove them out of their pueblo hundreds of years ago. Near the foot of this mountain, in a gully by a river, is a deposit of gray clay. Mrs. Alapawa has come here for many years to dig up just enough clay for a week's supply. This she will take home and dampen overnight by wrapping it in a wet cloth. The next morning, Mrs. Alapawa adds a piece of finely ground old pottery as temper to the fresh clay. This will prevent shrinkage or cracks when the pot is fired. The beginning of a new pot is a lump of clay rolled into a ball. Pushing her finger into the clay, she gradually works it into the shape of a bowl. The bowl is built up by adding coils or fillets of clay. The form is smoothed over with a stream-worn agate pebble. These stones are handed down from one generation to the next, and the more they are used, the smoother they get. After the shape is completed, newly made pottery is put inside the house for slow drying and scraped to the right thickness with a pottery scraper. For paint, a piece of manganese oxide is rubbed with water in a mortar of volcanic stone. Dried turkey weed, added to the paint, makes it stick to the bowl. A chewed up end of the midrib of a yucca leaf is used for a paintbrush. Mrs. Alapawa's hands are steady in spite of her years as she paints the traditional religious designs some of which are found on pots over 1,000 years old. Several pieces are painted before Mrs. Alapawa bakes them. At the left is a pottery owl, which is one of the sacred birds of the Zunis. After drying for several days, the pot is ready to be fired. This is done simply by baking it in an open-air fireplace in the yard. Dry manure is piled around the pot and the hole covered with a metal lid. The manure is set afire and burns slowly for several hours. After it has burned out, the finished pot is removed. The pottery maker looks it over to see whether there are any cracks or imperfections. Mrs. Alapawa doesn't have far to go to sell the pottery she has made. The trader dusts down the street, rates her work among the best in the Pueblo of Zuni. Across the plaza from the governor's house, next to the church ruins and the adjoining kiva, where the Zunis hold their sacred religious rituals, lives Harold Toussaint, jewelry maker, with his wife. The Zunis specialize in silver inlay work. Harold's wife polishes stones while he hammers the silver. They get all their raw materials from the trader. Turquoise mined in Nevada and Arizona. Silver sheets of various thickness. Silver wire for decoration. Shells of different shapes and colors from light amber to dark brown. and jet, imported from Italy. To make a bracelet, Mr. Toussaint has cut off a piece of sheet silver and split it into three connected bands which are filed smooth. The designs are put on with the dye supplied by the trader. They are checked to match the ornament. Mrs. Toussaint is finishing inlay work on a knife wing, symbol for another Zuni god. Because they live in a village where they have electricity, they use motors for polishing. 
The polished stone is cemented into the silver form. Indian women like much jewelry and wear their best pieces themselves when they go to the Indian fairs. At the exhibit halls, they can look at fine, softly colored blankets made by the Navajos and sold by Indian girls. They too bear the traditional religious designs that are found on all Indian handiwork. These vividly colored rugs are made especially for the white man because they are more to his tastes than the softly colored ones. Ancient Zuni pottery is also displayed, sacred ceremonial vessels showing designs of the plumed serpent who is the guardian of the sacred spring and the deer from whose heart line comes long life. Then there are heavy concho belts made by the Navajo craftsmen from hammered or cast silver. Jeweled wrist guards set with many stones and rings with sacred symbols made by Zunis many years ago. Figures of silver inlay work and antique solid turquoise statues that are prized possessions of families, traders and collectors. 